Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 5 of The Stand Show, the week of March 30th. I guess it's a Tuesday. Is it really the week of March 30th? The week of March 29th? I don't think I'm going to do that. This is not going to be the kind of intro for future episodes, so if you're seeing this one, consider yourself lucky. This is The Stan Show, episode 5. If you don't know, The Stan Show is where I, Nathan Stans, former GM to the stars, former esports marketing big shot of esports like conduct of the podcast, the greatest esports podcast of all time, went solo, did his own thing, goes out there and brings you the latest and greatest esports gaming news with a twist. The twist being, I'm smarter than everyone else, so my takes are right. Thank you for joining me. We've got a great show for you today. We're going to talk about 100 Thieves drama. We're going to talk about big YouTubers that I just learned about this week. We're going to talk about Mango versus Amaranth. Now that's a cage fight I'd like to see. And then as always, we are going to answer some viewer Q&A. But let's get started with the main story of the week. 100 Thieves in some hot water with Riot Games in what I will call a petty off a slap fight it was something that was so very uninteresting in which i feel like 100 thieves came out in the worst possible light so i came out with this thinking like this is not even worth talking about on the show right i know that 100 thieves was in the wrong i know that they looked like jackasses while they were doing it and then as i was doing my research i found out twitter took the side of the thieves huh Twitter thinks that Riot was in the wrong here. That 100 Thieves were valiantly defending their players and competitive integrity. Huh? And so I had to dig a little deeper. For those of you who haven't heard, let me read to you exactly what happened between 100 Thieves and Riot during the VCT Masters event last month or earlier in this month. So this all started with 100 Thieves playing Immortals in the Masters event. For some reason, I remember this because I was online watching It was delayed. It was supposed to start at noon. It's 12.15. No game. It's 12.30. No game. And this is pissing me off because the the Gen G game is after this and I have to wait for this series to go on. And so I'm thinking, okay, what's what's happening here? 12.45. No game. At 1 o'clock, finally, the game starts and I'm starting to hear these rumors. I'm getting messages from people in the Valor community. Hey, there's some drama going on in the background. There are some people that are saying shit is not right here. And it turns out that after the fact, Riot issued a $5,000 fine and placed 100 Thieves coach on probation for what happened during this hour. <clears throat> Let me read the competitive ruling from Riot. 100 Thieves prevented the start of the series despite the explicit instructions of the tournament operator to begin the series, VCT explained. Furthermore, 100 Thieves head coach Hector Frost Rosario demonstrated unprofessional behavior towards a tournament official. We are finding 100 Thieves $5,000 for an extensive broadcast delay due to non-compliance with tournament official decisions and replacing Frost on competitive probation for the duration of the 2021 Valorant Champions Tour. Now that could have been it. $5,000, are you, Nature wipes his ass with $5,000. You think he didn't make more than $5,000 off that Chipotle ad that we talked about on the last episode? You think he didn't make $5,000 playing in this random ass Fortnite tournament that he played in this week? nature has got the money. It could have ended here and no one would have cared. But that's not the 100 Thieves way. Oh, no, 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 no. 100 Thieves said, you know what? We're angry. I think we have an opportunity to clap back here. I think that we are a valuable asset in the Riot Games team portfolio, and Riot Games would be wary to try and turn fan perception against us. We have the fans, we have the conch, we get to speak. And so 100 Thieves released this statement. We disagree with Riot's competitive ruling against our Valorant head coach Frost and strongly disagree with Riot's public release and mischaracterization of the incident after we complied with their investigation around a minor competitive matter. In our previous match versus TSM, the tournament organizer made a ruling regarding ping and servers that favored our opponent. In our subsequent match versus IMT, the TO again made a ruling around ping and servers that was not in our favor, and which was in direct contradiction with the rules they cited previously in the TSM match. We were blindsided by the characterization of this issue and feel as if it has been blown out of proportion. We would have preferred for such a small issue to have been kept private. (laughs) We plan to pay our fine and move on from this matter. We feel our coach was fighting for our players and fans and advocating for competitive integrity. This is so funny to me because it's something that Rochelle 
says I do, and I say Rochelle does. And it's called being a last word Louie. They literally, see, they wanted to get the last word, and in saying the last word, they're like, what we want to do is pay our fine and move on, when they could have just paid their fine and move on. They obviously didn't want to pay their fine and move on, which is why they made a statement. And they didn't even leak the statement. They didn't even make the statement through a Nade Shot channel, through a Hiko channel, or through the Coaches channel. They posted a literal, beautifully formatted post on the 100 Thieves Esports Twitter. This is not something that they wanted to go away. So this was their attempt at a clapback. But hey, don't worry. They said we want it to end here. Unless... Unless 100 Thieves was going to release a video of the incident in question 10 minutes later. We want this to end. Then stop posting things about it. What are you doing? You obviously don't want this to end. That's me. That's me, a professional. A professional who understands that what they are saying and what they are doing are two different things. And what I have learned through this incident is that children do not understand, I guess, how to read nuance. Kids are reading this and they're thinking, yeah, 100 Thieves just wants to move on. Riot is scamming them. They just like TSM and Immortals, which doesn't make any sense to me. Why would Riot ever go in the way of Immortals? Riot hates Immortals. Riot doesn't like anything that Immortals is doing. Selling players, doing poorly in LCS. There's no world where Riot goes to bat for Immortals. So, no leak. They they want to put this to bed, but they're going to release a video. And so I watched this video. I watched this video on stream recently. It is a video of the five players here. I'm going to show the the live audience here who watching. A video of the five players, I'll turn off sound. Yeah. Sitting around while their coach is in Discord. And the players are sitting here stalling it out. What the players are doing is they're sitting in the shooting range so that Riot and the TO cannot start the game. Right? So they're just kind of hanging out here, just kind of vibing. Uh, the, the coach is literally screaming at the TO. Do you understand how stupid this is? You don't understand what this ping is. If you DQ us, there is going to be a bigger shitstorm for you. Now, ah, hold that. Hold that because part of Riot's accusation was that 100 Thieves' coach said he was going to leverage the social media presence of his players and his organization against the TO and against Riot. Now, this is the reason that Riot stepped in and made it public. The thought that Riot or any of Riot's approved TOs would give in to terrorism would let a little shitbox coach say, we are going to turn our Twitter fans against you? No, 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 no. You don't know who you're dealing with. This is Riot Games owned by Tencent, one of the biggest, most valuable companies in the world. We have shit bigger than you this morning. Are you kidding me? This coach, Frost, was also the CEO of Flipside Tactics, and he is a person who I did a little bit of research, no one in the community likes. I have no idea why Hunter Thieves picked him as a coach. I actually don't even think he's probably that good of a coach. I do respect that he tried to stand up for his players. You know what? I shouldn't talk shit about him. Maybe this was 100 Thieves trying to do it. I can understand getting caught up in the hype of arguing for your players, wanting to defend them, wanting to do what's right. But the thought of saying that this situation, him saying that you will be in a bigger shitstorm, was him threatening to leverage their social media. And then Riot coming out after the fact and saying, actually... That four minute clip that you sent us was not the whole video. This delay was one hour. There was a different moment during that hour when he said he was going to use the social media platforms of his players and organization against us. Not only have two third parties verified that he said that, but the coach himself told us that he said that. He admitted to him. Caught in 4K. He did an interview with Riot and he said that he threatened them. 100 Thieves, why? Why are you just lying, baby? Why would you do this? Your coach admitted to it. Why would you go out there and release a four-minute cut? This reminds me so, so much of FaZe Banks talking about Tifu. We talked about it on Esportsman Like Conduct, where every three seconds there was like a cut in the video because the guy can't string together a coherent fucking sentence. What 100 Thieves did is cut a four-minute segment where something kind of questionable was said, but it looked positive for 100 Thieves. And then did not release the other 56 minutes. So Riot came back, updated everything. <clears throat> and here was their second statement. Riot really puts this to bed. I actually really appreciate how professional Riot was about this. Three independent witnesses provided testimony that Frost made a statement to this effect. <clears throat> when asked directly about it in an interview by Riot League Operations personnel, Frost admitted that he made the statement. Although 100 Thieves provided Riot with a clip showing Frost's side of the conversation that does not include this statement, they declined to provide the full video to Riot. 
Oh, no. Oh, no. So that's the thing about it. I think that Riot was in the right. 100 Thieves was mad. They were having to play on a ping that they felt was not beneficial to them. They maybe were in the right of getting slighted. Maybe the tournament organizer made a mistake in their match against TSM. But what happens is when a tournament organizer tells you you have to play a certain way, you kind of have to do it. Otherwise, Riot's going to fine you. And honestly, they got away with a delay. They still had to play on a certain ping. $5,000 is nothing. When you try and use your fan base as a terrorist bomb against a large organization, you better be bigger than the game. You better be Optic in Call of Duty. You better be Season 2 TSM in North America. Because otherwise, Riot truly, truly doesn't give a shit. Because here's the deal. Big money is finally coming in. You have all of these traditional sports groups coming in. You have VC money investing in teams like EG who are willing to pay hand over fist to get in Riot's good graces, they don't want an organization that is shit-talking them. They don't want an organization that is talking back about their fines. And so I think that Riot was 100% in the right. I think that this marketing was terrible for 100 Thieves to release a statement that is in direct contrast to what your coach said in an official interview and to leave yourselves open to that kind of rebuttal. But on the other side, I have also seen in trolling through the Twitter that 100 Thieves fans are 11 years old and or have brain damage and don't believe that 100 Thieves made a mistake here. What are you going to do? I actually really like 100 Thieves as an esports org. I like their players. I like the way they play Valorant. I just think this was so unbelievably dumb and frustrating. I had to talk about it. People keep asking me about it. We'll see what happens. I do think maybe that this will be the push that was needed for more clear competitive guidelines for ping differences while we are in an online world. Maybe this will cause uh, like a new server farm for only competitive games in a more central location. Let's say Chicago. So the teams who are playing in LA have a better ping against teams who are playing maybe distributed across the central United States, for example, Texas, for example, Ohio, Michigan, things like that. Uh, the fact that they have to play in Dallas has really hurt 100 Thieves. 100 Thieves has been riding this line of, we want to bring all of our players to the compound so that on one hand, we can film content and make sure that we are delivering for our sponsors. And two, so that theoretically we have a big advantage, right? The players in person might play better. And so we are going to do that, but we are sacrificing a ping advantage. If Hiko was in Chicago, he might actually ping closer to Dallas than he is in LA. And if other teams have Canadian players, we are coast to coast against them. Which team is going to have the better ping? Uh, which was the problem. Uh, shout out to 100 Thieves for going for it. They really, they went all or nothing. I think they look like fools here, but their fans still like them, and I can't stop it. We talked about building a brand, and they have built a very strong brand. Power to them. That's enough esports. Ugh, esports is so hard and so stupid. Let's talk about things that aren't stupid. YouTubers, yeah, I fucking love YouTubers. Jake Paul, have my babies. I want to lick your sweat, Belle Delphine style. Mr. Beast is the greatest content creator that's ever lived. I've actually, um, <laughs> I've never watched a Jake Paul video. Not in my life. And I've only seen one Mr. Beast video, and it's where he went up and put a bunch of billboards up for PewDiePie. <laughs> so I don't actually know anything about them as content creators, which is important to know because I'm only going to talk about them as businessmen. So these two YouTubers have made some moves in the past few weeks to get into the world of high finance, to get into business, to leverage their money and use it to make more money. Jake Paul has started a new venture called the Anti-Fund, whereas Mr. Beast is now working with a company called Creative Juice to fund up and coming content creators, to give them that kind of little bit of boost, that gasoline, while taking ownership in their channel. So this is important because I think it's a watershed moment in gaming where big money is getting in utilizing the facade of large YouTubers as a Trojan horse that makes their deals palatable. Now, let me explain what I mean by that because this is what I've been thinking about all morning. <clears throat> Logan Paul or Jake Paul, sorry, Jake Paul and his partner are going to be using a system on AngelList called Rolling Funds. So you might think, let me tell you a little bit about what a fund is. A fund is where a rich person goes to all of his rich friends, says, give me your money. If you all give me $100,000, I am going to use that money to invest and I will pay you guys out profits. It'll be good. We're investing together. I will be the one that seeks out the businesses. I will be the one that reviews them and we will, we will be successful together. That's what a fund is. 
Now, the way that Jake Paul is doing this is he is using a rolling fund platform. So instead of going getting money from rich people, he is getting money from moderately rich people, but younger people, more individual investors through a rolling fund. So for example, you in the chat right now could invest in Jake Paul's anti-fund by going to AngelList. All it costs is $25,000 a month and it's only three months. You could, If you have $75,000, you could be a part of this. Now, what makes me feel bad is that why are we risking our money? Why is Jake Paul not risking his money? Because if you go into the details, it says that Jake Paul is gonna put in $10,000 a month. So Jake Paul is gonna put in $30,000 to my 75, and what's he gonna do, tweet about the companies? I don't trust him to validate this. Why isn't he going and getting rich friends? Why isn't he doing this? I don't like the way that he is monetizing his younger slash impressionable fan base as they get older. Yes, $75,000 is a lot of money, but I do believe as YouTubers get bigger, they are going to have more fans, more viewers who are upper middle class, or even wealthy, right? Let's say I grew up watching Jake Paul. I didn't because I have self-respect. Maybe I would put money into the anti-fund. Uh, it's just, it's something that really worries me. I don't like big business getting in. I like, man, there's two sides to this coin, which is so frustrating. I really like the idea that large creators, Jake Paul, Mr. Beast, Ludwig are able to leverage their success to make more money and do more creative things. I think the idea behind Creative Juice, Mr. Beast's uh, investment partnership that we will talk about right after this, is good and interesting. I think that YouTubers, Twitch streamers, cam girls should be able to do more than just sell merch, to slap a logo on a hoodie, to go do a meet and greet at VidCon. But what I fear are vultures. I fear dirty, dirty VC money coming in and using these pretty faces with large fan bases to extract value out of people who don't have excess value that can be extracted. That is my biggest fear. I don't like the fact that Jake Paul is on his second investment fund and the first one went bust. It just feels like people are going to lose their money and the ones who win are the people who aren't putting as much skin in the game, the ones who are just utilizing the fan base themselves. I just don't like it. If I hope that Ludwig doesn't join the anti-fund. Maybe Ludwig can create the anti-anti-fund. You know what I'm saying? Where you have to have a million dollars to invest and he just distributes it to small streamers and they don't get any investment. <laughs> I think that would be so fucking cool. Uh, let's talk about the other half of this, Mr. Beast. So we talked about how Jake Paul's is literally almost a pure scam, right? It is a rolling fund. He's investing very little money. His fans are investing a lot of money. Well, Mr. Beast is doing something different. A while back, he tweeted that he wished there was a way to invest. Here it is. I wish there was a way to invest in social media influencers. I don't know anything about the stock market and I find it boring. But when I see a channel I think will blow up, I wish I could buy shares in it or something. This is, this is a cute thought, right? The idea that I don't understand Palantir or GameStop or candlestick charts or inverse pyramids, technical analysis. But I do know, if I'm Mr. Beast, good content when I see it, right? I know that, I knew, for example, when I saw Ludwig in the first ever Ludlock, he was gonna be a big streamer. If I would have invested, if I could have invested $50,000 and got returns, I would have done it. And so I, I respect this. And so what he did is partner with a company called Creative Juice who are going to take money and invest it into small content creators or mid-sized content creators for a percent of ownership in their brand and company. Now at face value, I, this is gonna be very similar to the Jake Paul thing. At face value, this is new, this is exciting, this is cool. But I can't help but think the world of content creation is one of the last true meritocracies in the world, right? Anyone, and I mean anyone with internet can become a content creator. Anyone can put out a video. Ludwig went from random kid from ASU who likes Smash Bros to literally the king of Twitch. And the idea that some people are going to be getting boosts from VCs, that some people are going to have a leg up through money, that the people selecting this are going to be prejudiced in their own way. Like, look at the successful YouTubers. What are they, young, handsome, white men? If I'm Creative Juice and I'm trying to make a good investment, am I just gonna invest in young, handsome, white men? Is that gonna perpetuate the cycle of young, handsome, white men succeeding on YouTube? That is my biggest worry here. And then, 
Why are we not giving creators the fruits of their labor? I like the idea that they're getting a little boost, but here's the here's the tea, sis. Ludwig says you almost never need money to do these things, right? The biggest thing you need is a stream so you can make connections. You don't need twenty thousand dollars is not going to help a small streamer with bad content ideas become a big streamer. What they really need is creative guidance and collaborations, which Mr. Beast can do sans money. It's dangerous. I don't like it. We got VCs moving in big. Like I said, this is a watershed moment. All of a sudden, we are trying to monetize every aspect of what is pure in the world. We were already beholden to the algorithm. We have to create content this way. It's Among Us Monday. It's Drama Tuesday, which I, hey, I'll say it. I do it. But the fact that I will have to do that and that Mr. Beast and Creative Juice are going to be choosing the next content creators up terrifies me. And I am afraid that we won't see as many uh, contra points in the world or Jarvis Johnson's, right? People that I believe in, that I love, that maybe don't look like the standard YouTuber creating the standard YouTube content. It's just a prank, bro. With all that said... I went to Creative Juice's website and I saw this data backend thing and I jizzed my pants. I am a sucker for tech. If you don't know chat, I used to work at Patreon. And so I understand, and now I'm a full-time content creator. I understand the life cycle and business cycle for creators. I understand how the money comes in. And I track all of this myself with an Excel spreadsheet. So when I look at a backend that tells me how much money I'm making, the value of my brand as an individual, maybe able to forecast a little bit, see what months did better, what months did poorly, which channels such as YouTube, Patreon, Instagram, Shopify are growing the fastest, which merch drops did well. I do feel like there's some exciting things here. This is exciting to me as a tech platform and not exciting to me as a big idea of funding creators and taking, I was going to say stealing, and I feel like that would be too much of an exaggeration, of taking, sharing a portion of their channel success. I don't want the rich to get richer. I want young, cool content creators to do their thing and succeed. Although I would invest in it. Hey, Creative Juice, if you if you want to run like a sponsored ad on this podcast, or fucking Jake Paul, dude. Jake Paul, if you want to advertise the anti-fund, I will completely flip the script on what I just said. I'm in. Just let me invest at 10000 a month instead of 25000 a month. <laughs> please? Pretty please? On to the final segment of the pre-studied portion of the podcast. The rest is going to be all off the top of the dome. Mango versus any woman in a hot tub. If you don't know, one of my favorite Melee players of all time and a friend of mine, a friend of the Stan show, Mango, has been banned for three days on Twitch. Hey, pour one out for your homies, boys. Mango's gone. Uh, I'm not going to play the video that got Mango banned on Twitch. Hey, fuck it, or am I, baby? Let's do it. <laughs> Thanks, Kobe. Okay, so Joey I'm, I'm moving Kobe. has an anime action figure. Mango is drunk. <laughs> He's moving the figure back there. They're just drinking some brews and playing some melee. Having fun. This is TOS, yeah. I don't give a shit. Mango. <laughs> no, starts humping the base of the anime figurine. <laughs> it's so innocuous. It's so... It's so... That's a three-day ban, baby. That is a three-day ban. Get his ass banned. Get him out of here. Uh, I don't think that Mango should have been banned for that. It seems like good, harmless, stupid fun. The thought that he humped a figurine, right? I think it's, it's very silly. Now, it has gotten to the point where people who think that is silly and didn't warrant a ban are taking this other aspect, this other undercurrent of changes in Twitch and saying that there is a, a false dichotomy. There is a way that Twitch is pursuing these bans that is different for most people. For example, spreading your asshole on Twitch, three-day ban. Having sex with an anime figurine, three-day ban. Even Mango went so far as to tweet, why am I getting banned when all these people are doing hot tub streams? And this is where I'm going to flip the script. This is where I'm going to get a little crazy with. This is where maybe I have a little different take than you've seen on Twitter. Not a single hot tub streamer is stealing a view from you. If you are complaining about hot tub streams, 
Go touch some fucking grass, dude. What are you doing? Unless you are also a hot tub streamer, you are not competing in the same environment. No one is choosing besides maybe Brady. There's one user on the entire platform who watches me that might skip out on my stream to watch Amaranth in a hot tub. It is such a different world. And I've seen so many toxic, so many anti-woman takes on Twitter, on LSF, on Instagram, on all these platforms where people are upset set this is my gaming platform and i don't want to see them doing this then fucking don't click the stream you little bitch and i i swear to god there's a thread on lsf where people are like this is what's happening on our platform and two of the four pictures are women with 100 viewers they're not on the front page. One guy posted, this is on the front page right now. And he didn't realize that it was on recommended for him. That he's watching the hot tub streamers. He's part of the problem. The problem. I don't think it's a problem. I think free mango, free the hot tub streamers. No one should get banned for this. Twitch has a setting that says this channel is meant for mature audiences. Mango toggles that switch. Amaranth toggles that switch. At that point, I don't give two shits if you're in a hot tub. I don't give two shits if you're doing squats for subs, and I definitely don't give two shits if you are humping an anime figurine. Let the man hump, unban Mango, and stop fucking looking at what other people are doing for content. That, that's just it. That's just it. Are we murdering people? No. They're writing a name on their body. Okay. Okay, that's fine. I don't know why I get so heated about that one. I do hope Mango gets unbanned. I, and I do think, I've watched the video of him humming the figurine like 10 times. I think it's so fucking funny. It's so Mango. <laughs> Chad is telling me that's a cold take, but if you are on Twitter, if you are on Twitch or you are on LSF, that take is not cold at all. I would say that the vocal majority, and I will say it's the majority of Twitch, have a vendetta against hot tub streamers they don't like it and they don't like it because some of their favorite content creators don't like it and they don't like it i believe because there is an undercurrent of sexism being in a hot tub isn't sexual unless they make it such sure but no that let's let's that is again a distraction i don't think there is there anything wrong with with semi-sexual content they're not taking off their clothes like they're they're wearing cl enough clothes they are in a hot tub they are wearing appropriate clothes for the situation that's how i feel about it um, so I think that Mango should be unbanned. It was a harsh and unfair ban of Mango. But I think let's not get it mixed up. Let's talk about the actual problem, which is differentiated bans amongst content creators and fans using that to rail against a changing of the guard, more casual content, and women who are doing more body positive slash sexual content. I wouldn't even say succeeding on the platform because they're not succeeding. They don't have 100,000 subs. They don't have 50,000 subs. They don't even have 30,000 subs. Uh, so it's like, what's, what's happened? What's, what's the issue here? I don't, I don't understand who they're taking away from. That's, that's me. That's my understanding of the situation. Hey, but that's life. We will we'll talk about it more in the discord. If you guys want to talk about hot tub streams, if you want to talk about mango. If you want to talk about Jake, Paul, Logan, Paul, Mr. Beast, I think their names are. If you want to talk about 100 Thieves Valorant, join my Discord, exclamation point Discord in the chat. If you're on YouTube, go to my stream, type exclamation point Discord and check it out. Because it's time for the Q&A section. And for next episode, which I will be recording on Friday, we will be taking questions from the Discord. Join my Discord, go to the podcast room, and leave your question. I'll be checking them out. I'm going to take the best one, and I'm going to answer two of them on the podcast Friday. Question number one. Why do you think fighting games continue to be such a small niche within the esports space? What can Riot do with their fighting game to make it a primetime esport? This is a great question because we just finished talking about Mango. We just finished talking about Melee. Let's answer the first half first. Why do you think fighting games continue to be such a small niche within the esports space? Okay, so I think there's two big reasons for this. I think creative differentiation and alarming amount of choice, right? If I am a fighting game player, maybe I play Super Smash Bros. Melee. Maybe I play Street Fighter. Maybe I play Mortal Kombat. Maybe I play Scroll Girls or another anime fighter. Maybe I play another platform fighter. Maybe I play X, Y, and Z. There are hundreds, if not thousands of fighting games over the history of video games. And you can be a fighting game player playing any of them. Dragon Ball Fighters, things like that. It is harder to create a cohesive group that you can advertise to or that will attend an event when your games are so distributed. Dragon Ball Fighters only has so many fans. The biggest ones street fighter and melee only have so many fans which is why they have grown to a good height but cannot challenge 
the player base of a game like League of Legends. And then there's the reason the player base isn't as large. And that's because they're fucking hard and you can't blame anyone. When anyone asks me why I think fighting games are less popular than MOBAs, I give them an analogy or I compare it to StarCraft or StarCraft 2. StarCraft 2, or let's say Brood War. Sure, Brood War. I didn't play enough Brood War. I played more StarCraft 2. So I'm going to say StarCraft 2. But if you're going to roast me for saying it's the greatest game of all time, then just insert Brood War here and shove it up your butt. StarCraft or StarCraft 2 is the greatest esport of all time. It is unbelievably taxing, both mechanically and mentally. It is 1v1, so there is no one you can blame for your loss. The better player wins 100% of the time. Always. It is the esports esport. And guess what? No one wants to fucking play it, and no one wants to watch it. Because it's too hard, it's too scary, it's too stressful. People don't actually want to play the hardest, most prestigious game. They have mental hang-ups that cause them to not want to lose a 1v1 10 times in a row. They would love to queue into League of Legends and blame a teammate every couple games, as I have been doing in my Discord as I get back into League of Legends, right? They want to be able to blame someone else. And this same problem persists in fighting games. It takes a certain kind of personality to know that you are playing mono e mono, wumano e wumano, uh, they mono against they mono against someone else across the sticks. If they win, they were better than you, and there's not a single fucking excuse you can make. I don't give a shit if you're jet lagged, Leffen. I don't care if the sun was in your eyes or the venue was too cold. That's just how it is. I feel the better player just wins. And people don't like that. I don't like that. It's the reason I'm not playing all the new fighting games, right? They're just too hard. They make me fucking mauled. I mauled playing Melee, which I've been playing for six years. And that just makes it challenging to, to be a popular game. Which parlays us into the second half of the question. What can Riot do with their fighting game to make it a primetime esports? So, I'm worried. I am very worried because when I heard that Riot was making a fighting game, I thought that this is our opportunity. They can do what Wave Dash couldn't. If you don't remember, I believe Wave Dash was the studio that made um, knockoff Smash game. I actually went to their launch party at the Foundry. Basically, it was like a carbon copy of Super Smash Bros. Melee, but it had a few issues. It was on PC. Uh, I was, you know, everyone's gonna play it. I think that. If Riot had made a platform fighter that was accessible and that had more casual game modes such as team or other rotating ones, they could have taken the fighting game genre by storm. The problem is Riot bought a developer who was making a game called, I believe, Rising Thunder, which was a robot fighting game or like mecha fighting game. And so it looks like they are making a traditional 2D fighter, something like a Street Fighter, which is unbelievably hard. I don't think you can out Street Fighter Street Fighter. There have just been too many years of kids cooming over Kami. There have been too many years of people laughing as they command grab with Zangief. I don't think you can make one with a new IP and actually do it. I, I just, I'm really worried. Uh, the best thing they can do, I mentioned it earlier, create more casual game types. Try and avoid the, the 1v1 should be the prestigious game mode. That's what their tournament should be. But you need to add more game modes. Things like coin battle and melee, even though no one plays it. Things like maybe items. They, so their casual player base would get excited. I don't believe they're doing that. And so here, I think it's the first time I've said it on the pod. I don't believe the Riot fighting game will succeed. I think that it's going to fail. Maybe it won't fail as hard as the Riot card game did, Legends of Runeterra, but I think if they expect anywhere near the success of Valorant, which is their newest IP, or even TFT, which is their second newest IP that lives within League of Legends, uh, that's just, that's going to be a real challenge. A real challenge. Great question, though. I do believe, again, I'll say it, casual game modes and fighting games to grow the player base are the most important thing you can do if you want to make your fighting game a success. Absolutely. And the last question of the show, from an esports team perspective, how important is brand image and identity, and how do you integrate players across different games into this vision? For example, FlyQuest and the Saving the Environment. Yeah. So if you guys saw my bonus content, the greatest esports book ever written, it is about a book called Brands Win Championships. And in that episode, go watch the bonus content. I elucidate on it a little more. I fill you in on what's really important. I talk about this flywheel of building a brand, gaining sponsors, signing players, and having competitive success. And how that's how you move along the wheel and starting on brand is the most important part. There are 
dozens, if not hundreds of esports teams and failed esports teams that have avoided building the brand and are sowing the fruits of their labor, which is not success. There are also teams that have started that way and have realized that brand building is important, a la FlyQuest, as you allude to, uh, that are now starting to build a fan base that is different. FlyQuest started with a Save the Trees campaign. For every dragon we get, for every kill we get in LCS, we are going to plant a tree. Year two, we are going to save the coral reefs. We are going to do some underwater. All of a sudden, if you are a good person, if you are an environmentalist, if you like nature and you have no reason to root for other teams, why not pick FlyQuest? They've also started doing a concerted effort or building a, a platform to reach out to Spanish-speaking audiences. FlyQuest is co-streaming all of their games in Spanish, and so they haven't done it yet, or at least I haven't seen them do it yet. This is the perfect foundation for building a brand in esports. I'm so glad you said FlyQuest. They are doing things in environmentalism and charitable works. They are doing things in outreach to Spanish-speaking audiences in um, Mexico, Central America, South America. And all they have to do now, sign on more Spanish-speaking content creators. Maybe get a Spanish-speaking player on their LCS team or on their challenger team. Try and build this. Make sure that if you speak Spanish and you want to be a fan of the LCS, it is easy for you to be a fan of FlyQuest. And then all of a sudden, you're creating a walled garden. TSM can't crack that moat because they are not doing enough in that area. I think when I think of charitable teams, I think of FlyQuest. When I think of a team with good people, Megumi x is a good CEO doing good things in the world. I am excited about that. So that's a, a team that is doing it well. I think there's also teams that are doing absolutely nothing to differentiate. Now, I don't think it's going to matter. I'm not, I'm actually not trying to like talk any shit as I think this team is good and I think they're trending in an upwards direction, but TSM, I don't believe that TSM has a brand at all. TSM's brand to me was the best North American League of Legends team. That is no longer the case. I don't think that they have a brand in content creation as much. Maybe they have Hikaru. They have a brand of signing some Twitch streamers. Uh, they have a successful business venture in creating and running websites, but that's not a brand. I think that TSM has more to fear in brand building and has more to lose and are doing less than a team like FlyQuest. I think that Gen G for their first few years had no brand whatsoever. And then Gen G realized, you know who's underserved in this audience? Women in gaming. And if we're going to be a women in gaming brand, we have to walk the talk. So this is you talking about integrating players across different games. Gen G said, if we're going to be women in gaming, we are signing the best women Fortnite players. And they did it. They signed Maddie, Tina, Carly, Hannah, uh, Moki. Tina won the TwitchCon event. She's the first woman to win a professional Fortnite event, a big one, a LAN event, I should say. Moki, the first woman to qualify for uh, to, or to get first in a qualifier for a Fortnite major event. Gen G walks the walk. Now that Valorant came out, Gen G signing more Valorant women streamers and soon to be competitive players. That's the way that you integrate a shared vision across. I think FlyQuest can do it with Spanish speaking audiences and with charitable works. I think Gen G's doing it with women and I think teams like TSM are not doing it with anything. So, it's wholly important. I behoove you. I beseech you, please watch the bonus video of the greatest esports book ever written. It'll teach you a lot more about this, but brand building is truly, truly, truly the most important thing an esports team can do. And it's so different from what traditional sports teams can do because there are so many less restrictions. It's the reason 100 Thieves is succeeding while TSM is floundering. And that's today's episode.